of the Global Digital Finance Program. We're going to have a very rich discussion this morning with Professor Hugo Tadeu, which is our head of uh, innovation strategy at FTC. My name is Mark Palladino. I am the program director for FTC. And uh, I'm going to be helping you with the questions to the professors and to the, this, enrich our discussion this morning. We have here also Mary and Michelle from CKGSB School of Business, which is our partner in the development of this program. On this first session, Professor Hugo will be talking about the innovation strategies and uh, uh, the relationship with the sector. And uh, he invited uh, Mr. Agostinho Vilela, which is the head of innovation for IBM. So I hope we all have a very good and rich discussion for your busy agenda that you have uh, here with us this morning. We're going to be talking for about an hour. And uh, I also want to introduce you, Professor Oliviero Rodi, which is going to be making our second session of this program, of the three sessions of the webinars. And uh, so, Michelle, we want to say a little, a few words about uh, CKJSB, please, just for the, the people to know about our partner. No problem. Actually, I will let Mary to introduce the school and I will introduce um, the program. Okay. Uh, Mary, do you want to go ahead? Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'm Mary Wadsworth Darby, and I am the chief representative of CKGSB Americas based here in New York. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, this morning following on what Mark has just said. Um, for those of you that don't know Chung Kung Graduate School of Business, we are the leading private business school in China. And we were founded in 2002, by Li Kaixing, and we're the only private business school in China. We have campuses in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, and we have centers in Hong Kong, London, and here in New York. Briefly, we're basically recognized for our research, our faculty, and our unrivaled alum. Jack Ma of Alibaba is a graduate, uh, Chen Idan, who's the co-founder of Tencent, is a graduate, and many, many more. But very importantly, we are most pleased to be working and collaborating with our partner, Mark and FDC, on this series of webinars to be followed by a program. We're very excited and look forward to a very rich and informative morning. Let me now turn to my colleague, Michelle Yu, who's Program and Marketing Manager. Thank you, Mary. Um, Mark, do you wanna say a couple of words about the upcoming um, master classes? And I will follow with the introduction of the program. Yes, so please, Professor Oliviero, please, if you wanna say a few words about the second one. You're muted. Good morning, everybody. And just a just few words to say that uh, what is expecting for the next masterclass that will happen September 3rd uh, with the participation of the CEO or, of, uh, of Wiser Founding is a, a London-based uh, um, fintech specialized in uh, um, modeling uh, SME uh, credit scoring. Uh, the company was found by the pioneer of credit risk, uh, Professor Ed Altman, and will, is uh, helping uh, the banks uh, and financial institutions to meet the credit score for, for SME that we know uh, are living in a, a big problem of credit crunch during the every kind of tail risk uh, crisis. Uh, I'm looking forward to have you, all of you, on March, on September 3rd, at 9 a.m. Uh, Brazilian time. Thank you and good luck to my colleagues, uh, Hugo Tadeo and to Agostino Villela for, for the today's seminar. Right, thank you very much. So please, Michelle. Right, and following that, we will have the third masterclass talking about the global digital financial services 
um, featuring a professor from FDC who is an expert on fintech and also a business practitioner on fintech and also a VP and executive from, um, maybe I pronounce it wrong, um, Banco Inter, who is um, a rising star in the fintech landscape in Brazil. So we're very looking forward to have that discussion. Um, and on top of that, if you are interested in learning more about the global fintech landscape featuring innovation cases from China, Brazil, and the US, please click uh, the link in uh, down below the YouTube video and you will see more information about the upcoming online program in November that we're having with FDC together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Just adding to what Michelle said, we designed this program for you, uh, everybody who works in the financial ecosystem and also everyone who is interested in getting to know more about this excitement environment. So this morning, I'll let Professor Hugo introduce Agostinho and I hope we we'll have a great morning. And in the end, we'll come back with more information about the program, the webinars, and also with your questions for the professors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you to Daniel. Thank you to all of you. Daniel, Mark, Oliviero, uh, Michele, Agostinho. It's really an opportunity, really an opportunity to discuss innovation first and then the digital trends uh, to the financial sector. Agostinho, please, I just want to introduce uh, maybe nine key points uh, before your presentation. Again, about innovation and then to the financial sector. Uh, and please be uh, free after me to discuss uh, your point of view. So the first key point that I have here uh, in my notes uh, that I just wrote uh, in the end of the, uh, the last day in my, my notes here, uh, it's about the market capitalization. So uh, since 2010, uh, we are observing a change uh, in the economy and really in the financial sector. Uh, in the past, uh, we had companies like ExxonMobil, Microsoft, uh, Walmart, uh, Procter Gamble, GE, Johnson Johnson, with the highest uh, market capitalization. Now we have a concentration in tech companies like Apple, IBM, uh, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, among others. So it's a kind of uh, changing in the market and obviously uh, in the payment solutions. The key point number two uh, that I have here uh, in my notes, it's about some FDC research uh, data that we have. So in January of this year, uh, we did uh, an exciting research with some uh, executives in Brazil about innovation and digital strategies. So for the first time, we have a question about digital. So the questions, it's, uh, it's a kind of simple question that we discuss with uh, these executives. So what does uh, the term digital means to all of them? Uh, and the question was, and the, the, and the answer was that 48, again, 48, uh, give us the response that digital means a switch from analog to digital. Great answer, but really, in my point of view, it was insufficient uh, because we had a name to be something like data management uh, or kind of efficiency or software or investments. So we think that the understanding uh, of digital, maybe it was incorrect uh, in the Brazilian context. So it would be better, really. I think that it would be better. Continue to our um, key point, again, in the key point number two with the FDC research, we have a second qu a question about uh, digital too and trends. Uh, and that, uh, the question was, what do we think about trends? And 88% of the executives, the response that, that, that they made to us, they understand that digital is about connectivity and internet of things, just about that. And we think that we wanna do some things with data, trends, analytics, and so on. And continue to the key point number two about the FDC research uh, and data. Uh, we observe that 57%, 57%, may you take a look here again uh, in the notes, uh, that, they in, that they indicate that the company structure and culture are a huge problem about digital strategies in the Brazilian context. So I have a question to all of you. Do we think that we have the right skills to the digital transformation? Do we think that uh, we are investing right uh, in new skills and capabilities. So think about this kind of question because I think that is a huge thing to discuss with all, with all of us. And again, with Agushin, um, when I finish here, my key points. 
The key point number three, I think that it's a good question too. It's about be digital or go digital. I think that, you know, Professor Clayton Christensen, professor at uh, Harvard uh, Business School, uh, and they think, and I think too about that, about values. So what kind of organization do we want to uh, uh, believe uh, for the future? So I think that organizations cannot disrupt themselves without autonomy, without values, without resources, without uh, the right process. So I think that we want to talk about the skills and I think that, you know, about the 10 skills that the World uh, Economic Forum, that they have uh, about digital. So when I return here to my key points, I just want to remember you about the skills, some skills that I think that they are important. For example, about innovation, about learning, about creativity, about technology and programming, about critical thinking, about complex uh, problem solving, and so on. So I think that we want to discuss digital innovation and skills to construct a, dif a different future uh, in the financial sector. The key point number four, I think that uh, it's very important too. Uh, the key point number four is reskilling. So I have a question to all of you. Do you really understand about data? Do you really understand about data mining, machine learning and techniques and maybe mega trends like 5G uh, and blockchain? Because if not, it's time to return to school and to reskill because I think that we live in a technology world and the C of the coronavirus is started a data-driven uh, revolution in our uh, financial sector, in our market, uh, in the economy. The key point number five, and uh, I will finish it, it's about trends uh, in the financial industry. If we observe some trends, I think that we have uh, some platforms. And for example, Amazon, they're developing a kind of payment cash methods and I think that we want to observe things like Amazon, uh, Amazon Pay, Amazon Cash, and some QR code uh, solutions. So this key point number five, uh, I think that it's important to continue, for example, with some uh, observations that I made here in Brazil. Uh, I think that we have Amazon, but I think that we have Magazine Luiza, for example. Uh, it, and, and I think that they are uh, having a kind of digital platform adoptions and some data-driven techniques and innovation strategies to, to develop our market and the financial solutions too. Uh, continue in the key point number five, I think that we have some trends. And uh, I have a question too, to all of you. Do you really imagine something like uh, the data-driven economy in China, uh, maybe five to 10 years ago? Because I think that the Chinese market, that they are working with data, uh, not data, with data and care code solutions, to develop uh, a new strategy to the world. So if I have the key point number five, I think that it's important to discuss the key, uh, the key point number six here in Brazil that we call the PIX platform. So here, I truly recommend you to observe some deep dive uh, documents about PIX platform and some Banco Central initiatives. Maybe shortly, uh, in, the, in a short time, will you have some QR code solutions in a more competitive, competitive market uh, um, um, uh, oriented uh, solutions here in Brazil between uh, the traditional banks and fintechs. And really the focus is our, our clients and solutions uh, to be developed. And finally, I think that we have the key point number seven that we have to pay attention in the fintechs uh, valuation, another crucial thing. Because when we take a look in the market valuation of the fintechs all, over the, all around the world, here in Brazil, we just have three fintechs with a huge uh, valuation. So with, we have to observe the Brazilian market and then the American market and the Chinese market to have drift, uh, different solutions uh, to have uh, innovation and digital strategies. And finally, the key point number eight, uh, I think that it's, it's the end of my point of view here. I truly recommend you really recommend you uh, to reading our innovation uh, report uh, and digital impact, uh, digital impact uh, reports too. Uh, and for example, I wrote a paper with my colleague, Carlos Braga. Carlos is a former uh, CEO of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And uh, we are writing a lot of uh, different reports just to pay attention and just to show to all of you the importance of the digital and innovation revolution that we are having having here in Brazil and of, and of course, all around the world. Finally, Agustin, my friend, I think that you have uh, time. Maybe I take a look here. 
maybe 30 minutes to show us uh, our point of view about innovation, projects, and maybe trends. And in the end, I will return here to discuss with you some Q&A um, and to have some ideas uh, to all of my friends here. So, Agushin, this is all of my, my key points here. And I think that it's your time to present to us uh, your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo, for the invitation. And thank you all um, for attending this event. Uh, and thank you, Daniel, for uh, helping me attend this event and putting things together. Um, so as Mark and Hugo uh, pointed out, uh, my name is Agustin Villela. I'm the IBM Latin America Innovation Director. So let me, sh let me share my screen here for just a sec. Okay. Um, you guys can see my screen, right? I'll just make it full screen, okay. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, right. It's okay, Agustin. Okay. okay, great. So um, just quick intro about myself. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the uh, IBM Latin American Vision Director. Uh, I do happen to be a member of the IBM Academy of Technology as well, which is how I got to know uh, Professor Ugu. And I'm also what's called with an IBM a distinguished engineer. Uh, our, it's basically our core of our most senior um, technicians. So it's important to highlight that this uh, presentation of mine here um, um, reflects my own opinions. Of, even though there's an overlap with IBM's opinions, but they're uh, mostly my own, okay? Just just point that out. So I'm just gonna go through a, a fairly uh, quick agenda here. And uh, this presentation is a presentation that I did a few weeks ago to uh, FTC, uh, FTC's uh, Innovation Reference Center uh, meeting. And I adapted to this specific event here uh, to give it more of a, a, a view with regards to the financial industry. But, but it basically, it came from provocation that uh, Uber brought forth, which is uh, what's going to happen uh, with innovation given the pandemic and, and the change it has caused in the entire landscape. So it was a very interesting um, challenge that uh, Uber posed. And so it kind of forced me to think about it and, and, and do some research about it. And so what changed from the previous presentation was that I sort of bias this one here more towards um, the, the payments in the financial industry. So just a quick uh, a slide on my sponsors, <laughs> kind of. Uh, um, um, so like, like I said, what brought me uh, close to and FTC was, was not actually my day job, but the fact that I'm a member of the IBM Academy of Technology. Um, IBM has roughly um, 350,000 employees, about half of them being technicians. And so 175,000 technicians. And of those, um, we have an organization called the Academy of Technology that's a um, cross business unit that congregates our technical leaderships. It's about 800 members or so. And within the Academy of Technology, uh, we have sort of an internal, more core group, uh, which I call the Art Pulley Bureau, uh, which is Academy Leadership Team. I'm, I'm a member of the Academy Leadership Team. Okay. And, and like I said, it was through the Academy of Technology that I got to know um, FDC. Um, so let me start by giving some context. I, I think it's no news to anyone that um, um, COVID has taken the world by storm. Okay, um, in, in, in fact, it has changed our, the lives of everyone on this planet here since its inception in December 2009, since people became aware of it. Um, the, the death toll uh, is definitely appalling and horrible, obviously. I mean, it has touched the lives of I guess everyone here on this call here in some way, um, with more than 30 million people having been affected. And uh, not only uh, of the death toll and the medical implications, but the economic implications are profound. Uh, and so uh, tapping to one of the sources of my presentation here, um, McKinsey has put out this very interesting study on COVID-19 implications for business. Uh, the, the impact on the world's GDP, as many of you have probably heard, is humongous. Uh, it, it varies from, from country to country, and the estimates are still uh, being tallied, but it's going to be a very significant ballpark of up to 10%. Okay, and depending on the sector, it might take quite a while to recover. So even uh, if the uh, economy uh, rebounds after a while, it's still going to take a while for many sectors to recover. Some of them are going to be obviously more more impacted than others. And uh, another study that I'm, I'm leveraging on this presentation here, as I mentioned, the IBM Business Value uh, Studies um, says that 
uh, a, a cumulative loss about $12 trillion, okay, uh, until the end of the uh, pandemic, until things sort of get back in place, which again, humongous uh, figures. So, I mean, these are still rough estimates, but their uh, their magnitudes are comparable, certainly, to the um, 2008 crisis, if not more, okay? You know, very interesting thing to point out is that even the companies who are thriving will be impacted, which is something not so obvious, not so intuitive, in the sense that even the companies that are thriving, they will have impact in their supply chain. So it's not just about companies that are losing revenue, that are, that are not uh, they're losing clients, etc. The demand has gone down, etc. Uh, even companies who have seen a rise in demand are having a, a hard time just uh, uh, fulfilling this demand uh, because it cannot uh, get uh, uh, products from their suppliers. So the 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 impact of supply chain is very pervasive. So this is something that uh, kind of makes you think you know, about opportunities and innovation in order to address that. Uh, and as everyone knows. And the pandemic has forced us to work from home. I mean, uh, uh, well, a case in point here is uh, all of us here are doing this uh, presentation from uh, from our houses here, and so we have four times more employees working from home, and it has a profound impact on the economy. Obviously, I mean, to 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 retail uh, for for starters, and uh, the fact is, it has forced upon us a digital transformation where uh, executives uh, of all clients are now expecting. Uh, their customers in turn to prefer online channels. So once people get exposed to online channels, uh, executives expect that most of them will remain uh, leveraging online channels. So but I can see here, even at, at home, my, my wife is very reluctant to uh, uh, adopt, for instance, online, uh, um, to buy, buying from a supermarket online, buying groceries online, and now she kind of became used to it. So that after you overcome the initial resistance, people kind of understand that it's, it's not so hard, it's not, it's not bad at all, it's very convenient, et cetera. Um, just uh, going forward uh, within this context, it's interesting that the business priorities have changed quite a bit. I'm going to go into that uh, um, in, in a short while, but basically, obviously, workforce safety and security has become paramount. It's obvious. I mean, uh, even places that have reopened, as we all know, have changed very, way, uh, very much the way they, they have reopened, like uh, social distancing, uh, masks, as I know. Yeah, um, 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 hand sanitizer, all sorts of protocols. Um, uh, every company has put in place some kind of crisis management team. Um, uh, IBM for sure has one. Uh, and cost management has become something very, very important. I want to touch into that in a little while. Okay. And together with cost management, obviously, quality management. So these are classic uh, defensive measures and customer retention. Okay. So you, you, you see sort of the traditional defensive measures that you would expect in, in a crisis of this uh, size here. Okay. But uh, the interesting aspect here, this is the part where it gets not so intuitive, is uh, companies are increasing capital investments to build these abilities. So one would expect that um, you would just see cost management in the sense of company just cutting down on costs. Okay. That would be the most obvious, the, the, the less technical, less sophisticated way to defend from the crisis. In, in fact, that's what we expect at IBM. Like 90% of companies just go on cost cutting and just maybe 10% uh, trying to invest to do cost management, uh, uh, liquidity management efficiency uh, improvements uh, through investment. But it's actually been the opposite. Like 90% of the companies are actually investing to make these improvements to this management. And only 10% have gone down to just playing cost cutting. So it's interesting how companies are investing, are in fact uh, are reaching out, seeking innovation in order to achieve these things here. And um, last but not least, and this is something that everyone has talked about, everyone knows, in fact, uh, Uru alluded uh, to a few minutes ago, is digital transformation has become priority, has taken the world by storm, just like the pandemic itself, and has been forced upon us, uh, uh, to be more accurate, okay? And so interest uh, from executives on digital transformation has like uh, almost tripled, okay? And it, it, it's obvious to say so, because I mean, uh, it was forced upon society. So whether executives like it or not, they have to make their transformation happen. Um, going forward, and, and uh, I, I like this part here, particularly because I think very much aligns with uh, my day job, is uh, you, you keep on hearing uh, again and again from different sources, companies that will thrive, that will survive the pandemics have to be designed for speed, okay? So uh, I, I think the two uh, uh, most recurring terms I keep on hearing are, uh, besides the digital transformation itself, is operation efficiency and speed. So I think that's where, a lot, that's where the opportunity lies, okay? Uh, obviously, projects have to be aligned with digital transformation, but 
first and foremost, they have to address operational efficiency and have to be done in speed, okay? People are interested in things that will have a very distant outcome. They're gonna take a while in order to, to show time to value, okay? Uh, and uh, obviously resilience is very, very key to your business, uh, not only for this pandemic, but for uh, upcoming crisis that we might have in the future. And I think this pandemic has, has taught everyone that uh, companies were not ready for the un for the unforeseen at this scale. And so a lot of companies aren't just discussing uh, surviving the pandemic, but actually not being uh, be taken by storm, by surprise again, if something uh, uh, similar to what happened now uh, happens in the coming years. So uh, more and more, there's been, there have been talks about being more resilient, okay? And uh, to that effect, um, more and more you hear companies talking about uh, uh, dynamic delivery in all sorts of techniques in order to become more resilient, okay? And an interesting thing that uh, I, I found out uh, um, through IBM's consultancy arm is that uh, you can actually uh, gain operation efficiency and at the same time improve top line, which is not so intuitive because when you think about operation efficiency, uh, you tend to think more about improving profit, improving bottom line. But uh, in fact, even the companies who are thriving, again, relating to the issue on, on supply chain, uh, they, are, they are thriving in, 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 a, in a cumbersome way in the sense, in an inefficient way in the sense that they may be acquiring three new clients but losing two in the process because they are providing uh, a very seamless uh, customer experience or they're having issues with their, with their supply chain and such. And so you can actually uh, improve operational efficiency in the process, improve churn, okay, or reduce churn, and, and therefore improve top line as well. So these things, actually, they are not uh, opposing gold. Um, moving forward, um, something that's interesting to point out is IBM has come, has come out with a, a set of prescriptive recommendations to companies and even internally as to things that we should be focusing on considering the pandemic. And so the first one is, is pretty straightforward, is empower remote workforce. For us, IBM, it was fairly easy because uh, everyone in IBM world is used to working at home at least part-time, part like once a week or whatever. Every, every single employee of the company, as far as I know, has a notebook. But it's not uh, so obvious to most companies in the world. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, and I think probably it happened, it happened elsewhere as well, uh, uh, literally, the market ran out of notebooks. I mean, uh, IBM, for instance, uh, we would sell or use notebooks. Notebooks are used internally. So there's an aftermarket for the, our internal notebooks. And our stockpiles were just sold out because uh, 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 in, a, in a matter of days, companies uh, uh, throughout Brazil, and I guess throughout the world as well, uh, were just scrambling to get notebooks to equip their the employees who were used to uh, working with desktop. But these companies were not prepared to send their workforces home. Okay, so you have to empower remote workforce, at least in this, this very basic aspect, but it's actually much more than that. You have to put in place VPNs, say, VPNs and all sorts of, uh, of measures in order to allow your employees to work from home. And, and, and that's not trivial. In fact, that created a tremendous um, uh, uh, business opportunity for, for companies like IBM. And uh, in tandem with that, you have to engage customers virtually. I mean, uh, I've been doing uh, events with clients, doing uh, uh, workshops with clients, doing meetings with clients virtually because but there's no way for me to meet them in person. And so you have to change the dynamics as to how to do that. Uh, meetings have to be shorter, have to be more right at a point. So everything changes uh, to that effect. And not only that, uh, people have to leverage more social uh, uh, metrics. So uh, throughout the world, uh, companies have been asking themselves, how can I improve my social presence, et cetera? And how can I extend my social presence so that it's not limited to just a set of employees within a company? How can I actually teach every single employee of mine to have a social presence to engage uh, socially? Okay. And thirdly, again, so I'm so corollary, uh, corollary of the previous uh, two other points is remote access to everything. So, for instance, uh, in my specific case, I'm setting up a lab, a uh, 4G, 5G lab with a, a partner. This is a, uh, something I'm working on right now. And uh, we were expecting to work on the lab uh, uh, physically. You know, uh, it's, it's a 4G, 5G lab, so you have radios, you have kinds, all kinds of um, uh, communications gear there. Uh, but we're, we're figuring out how to work on, on this lab remotely. Okay? And this is happening across the board. You have to figure out how to do things remotely. Uh, sometimes it's easier, but when it comes down to, to, phys to the physical world, to manufacturing stuff, it's not so obvious, not so straightforward. And companies are having to figure out a way to, to address that. And fourth, and probably my favorite, is agility and efficiency, which touches very much uh, what my specific organization, what I'm really doing on my day job. How, how in an agile, in a very expedient way, 
uh, can provide uh, operational efficiency through innovation. This is something I'll touch in a little while. Uh, fifth, uh, protecting against um, cybersecurity risk. It's amazing, it's appalling um, uh, how much um, cybersecurity attacks have risen uh, during the pandemic. I, I heard uh, figures like it has increased like fourfold, and which kind of makes sense because um, uh, all of a sudden everyone had to work from home and many companies were not prepared for that. So they didn't have the proper VPNs in place, didn't have the proper uh, measures in place. Um, and they're, they're, they're uh, uh, public exposures uh, were not uh, adequate from from security standpoint. So, I mean, it has risen tremendously, uh, especially in the, in the government sector. Uh, and again, um, you, you want to gain a pr operational efficiency, you want to gain uh, supply chain continuity, which, which is something I alluded to previously. So even companies who are thriving are being impacted. Uh, so it's impact uh, for companies, not just uh, losing clients, not just losing revenue, can you actually be uh, impacted in the sense you're not able to deliver the goods and services you, you, you wanted because of supply chain. And, and, and last but not least, again, uh, support health providers. I mean, uh, a, a, a large share of the government's, uh, government budgets on front of order has been properly so redirected to the health sector. And, and obviously that creates a, a tremendous set of uh, business opportunities and innovation opportunities, very interesting ones, by the way, in order to help uh, um, the medical sector co uh, cope uh, with this crisis. So for instance, uh, many companies have put uh, time and effort into developing um, contact tracing technologies, um, test pulling technologies, um, um, uh, alternative ways to diagnose uh, COVID, such as using acoustic insights and such. So uh, a, a lot of uh, innovation has been put in place in order to help uh, health uh, providers, besides um, techniques involving CRM, et cetera, in order to do manual contact tracing and, and actually do the entire process of uh, following the life cycle of patients and such. So uh, this is definitely a, a, an area of tremendous opportunities in terms of innovation. And the society is craving for that, obviously. So let me touch now into my day job. Uh, as the IBM Latin America Innovation Director, uh, I basically uh, work on two fronts. First, I own the venues within IBM Latin America where we showcase IBM innovation, our so called client centers or showrooms. And obviously, these venues at the moment are closed due to the pandemic. So they are existing, but in a virtual fashion. And the second part of my job is to uh, provide what we call um, last mile innovation, uh, which are basically prototypes uh, to meet the demands from clients, meet um, challenges from clients uh, in what we call pre-garage work in IBM lingo. Uh, meaning, um, basically my organization creates prototypes as a very, very efficient way of putting front of client very quickly a solution to their challenges, to their business problems. And the way we do that is uh, we use a, a technique that we have coined as extreme agile, which basically uh, leverages some aspects of the traditional agile, uh, such as uh, customer centricity, daily playbacks, uh, daily stand-up, sorry, uh, weekly playbacks, and uh, confused learning. So these are the four pillars that we, we definitely leverage from agile, but we sort of uh, mingle that uh, with um, Skunkworks uh, approach from Skunkworks approach from Lockheed. Uh, Lockheed is created back in World War II, and which is basically unencumbered um, innovation. So uh, by doing so, we have been doing that for the last few years. We have created a very, very fast moving team that is able to put in front of the client uh, a prototype of an innovation that a, the client's uh, looking for in less than four weeks, in one to four weeks at the most. Okay. Uh, and we, can present that physically or virtually nowadays has to be virtually okay and the interesting thing is that that's where we sort of break away from traditional agile approaches is we make high fidelity prototypes so uh contrary to what normally is preached in the literature um, start small start uh, 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 uh low fidelity start sometimes even with paper prototypes we actually uh go through trouble making um high fidelity prototypes and by doing so even though we we, we, we incur into some risk we have the benefit that there's less of a gap, less of a possibility of friction when you move from prototype into MVP, into production, okay? And so uh, basically by working this in, in this fashion, we're able to create prototypes that serve as demos, but at the same time can be leveraged as accelerators uh, to the sub subsequent stages of the innovation pipeline. So uh, again, we, we work with this uh, Scumforce models, uh, Scumforce model, 
we obviously our focus is on um, um, industry use cases. Uh, we are scoping sessions where where we basically we co-create with clients. They're very speedy, very fast, thirty to sixty minutes. So it's different from normally you find in a market uh, where people tend to to resort to um, same thinking other techniques that are more time consuming and they are very relevant for the subsequent stages but not for this stage where you really want to go fast really want to move fast okay and by doing um, a weekly or bi-weekly um, reviews or playbacks we basically tweak uh, our prototype in order to to make sure it suits the clients, uh, clients needs. So that's where uh, customer centricity comes into play very strongly. So basically, uh, again, the process is client brings us a, a, a demand, innovation, a requirement, or either the client or someone from uh, internally with IBM who is in a position to speak on behalf of the client uh, uh, with proper knowledge. And based on that, uh, we hear them out 30 to 60 minutes and then I engage my team. If, if, if it's a meaningful case, if it's something that we can do and if there's significant impact to warrant our involvement. And uh, in one or two weeks, we start doing playbacks in maximum four weeks, but we put in front of the client a prototype that hopefully addresses their needs and it's already prime time um, to be moved on to the garage if the client uh, decides to move forward with us. So with that, let me show some um, examples of what has taken place in Latin America based on this methodology that I just described here, okay? So uh, this project is actually um, a pre-pandemic, but uh, I, I'm researching this project because of discussion about PICS uh, and because of the, uh, of the search for uh, contactless uh, payment methods for even for hygienic reasons. And so this project here was called Blue Pack. Uh, it was inspired uh, on what I saw in China uh, uh, with WeChat Pay and the likes. Okay, it's based on QR payment. Um, it has, as, as most uh, um, QR-based um, payment methods, the static part and dynamic part. The static part is when you want to read a QR uh, code from the merchant in, in order to, to make a payment. Uh, the dynamic part is if you instead want the, uh, the merchant to read uh, a dynamically generated QR code uh, uh, for, for which they can uh, uh, pull money from your account. In, in, in both scenarios, you have to have the, the, the client has the final say on approval on the payment, et cetera, so it's, it's safe. Uh, we, we didn't uh, put in place an entire process of payments, it's actually fairly complex, but we did this experiment in order to see how complex it would it be to create the user interface, uh, the user experience, and the back end for the user interface. And it turned out it wasn't terribly complicated, so it was something pretty interesting to do. And in fact, this picture here uh, is actually was taken at the IBM store in the building, in the IBM building. Um, this is another pre-pandemic project, which again, uh, uh, interesting, in, in, interesting in it is researching because of the pandemic. And, and in this project here, I think has you know, uh, uh, all, uh, has strong reasons, strong uh, features to make it relevant, uh, especially in the current scenario, and, and especially because it's catered for the unbanked. Uh, it basically involves uh, creating an online um, wallet um, using blockchain and leveraging um, uh, phone line credits in order to do payments. So uh, in a way, uh, the phone company becomes sort of the uh, financial institution. And uh, it, it basically, the phone company builds an ecosystem around them, um, for instance, uh, retailers, and uh, at which... Uh, the, the person who's running the phone uh, company app, company's app can uh, um, scan QR codes of, of merchandise, make payments, and these payments, in fact, become just charges, uh, uh, debts uh, to their uh, uh, current um, phone company credits. And using uh, blockchain, you're able to track the entire process and do the necessary clearance, necessary uh, reconciliation in order to make sure the payments happen to the merchants of the ecosystem, all in a very um, transparent, in an auditable way. So really, really interesting project. And uh, the team that has built this is not actually my team, but it's a team that's associated to mine. And this was done in Mexico about two years ago. And in fact, uh, I, I had the team who, who did this project uh, presented to, to uh, the company worldwide yesterday, uh, because I think it's really powerful. And again, I think it's very relevant to the current environment we're living in. But this is clearly a pandemic project. This was something we did very recently is by online pickup and store georeferent. By online pickup and store has been around uh, for quite a while now, it's not nothing new. Uh, the new here is the georeference aspect of it and to basically allow you to create a by online uh, pickup and store georeference uh, 
um, um, experience in order to be able to uh, make picking far more efficient. So for instance, imagine a shopping center or a, a, a large department store that has its own mall uh, where you can buy from them and, make, and basically the store will be able to know where you are so that they do the picking, they separate the, the, the merchandise only when you're close enough to pick it up. So you make the picking process far more efficient. And uh, throughout the experience, you're able to provide upsells and cross sells, and even change uh, the time to pick and look. I changed my mind. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna stop by afterwards. So the 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 the, the uh, shop and the outlet can uh, uh, basically uh, uh, redirect your priority, priorities of their uh, picking uh, area uh, based on that. So it's it's really uh, geared towards making the whole process of of buying line picking pick on the store far more efficient. Uh, another clearly uh, uh, COVID-related project here, and which very much aligns with uh, IB, what IBM preaches uh, on our Big Seven, is um, our basically cognitive collection um, project, which is based upon orchestrating the entire process of uh, debt collection. Okay, this was uh, initially created for banks, but it's because it become so popular. In fact, it has become sort of a hot cake for us that we created versions for insurance companies. We are creating versions now for telcos because every single business expects people to, to run behind their payments uh, for obvious reasons, given the huge economic impact of the pandemic. Okay, And uh, every single institution we have spoken with has, a pro ha has some kind of system in place for that. I mean, debt collection is not something new. Uh, but none of them has something so thorough, so, so seamless, so integrated, so end-to-end. -end. And again, everything that we do in my team are real prototypes. These are not mock-ups, okay? I mean, obviously the data that we use is mock data, but the system orchestrators are really exist. And, and, and customers were just appalled by how thorough uh, uh, the solution um, is. And uh, it's interesting, feedback we got from clients was like, it would have taken us to do something of this kind, like maybe three to six months. And my team was able to do this in four weeks. Okay. <clears throat> uh, oh no, actually I was talking about uh, this one here, but, but this project here is related as well. Uh, this project here is actually a repurposing of the cognitive collection I was alluding to. Uh, it's actually inverted here. Uh, this one here is an orchestration for uh, POS deployment. Okay, so for, for point of sales uh, devices like the ones where you uh, swipe your, your, your credit card. And uh, it's an orchestrator for point of sales devices. But what's interesting about this project is that we can orchestrate basic deployment of anything. It could be point of sales, it could be a customer premises equipment for a telco and, and, and such. And so it, it was uh, repurposing of this uh, cognitive collection project. And it, it basically follows up the entire process of POS equipment deployment. So it relates to the payment industry. And what's interesting about it is that uh, um, the payment industry gets everywhere in the world. Normally, uh, the, the companies that deploy the equipment are not the, 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 the companies that, uh, the, that acquire it themselves. Are basically, they have vendors who actually deploy these uh, machines, the, the, the point of sales uh, um, credit card, debit card machines. And these vendors, uh, there, are, there are a plethora of vendors, and they have all, all sorts of problems like going to the wrong address, uh, going at the wrong time, et cetera. So basically, uh, this asset here follows uh, the entire process from the uh, ticket search. Uh, take us in order to, to make sure these POS devices are delivered, all the way to making sure they have been properly installed, uh, et cetera, they have been properly deployed. So it's an orchestrator inspired on this project here of debt collection, okay? Um, cognitive advice, this is our latest project and I'm super fond of it. <clears throat> it basically is an investment advisor that uh, uh, works in, 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 in two mo very important moments in terms of uh, uh, financial advice. First, when people are building their profile based on their dreams, aspirations as to what, one, what they want to accomplish with investment, like buying a car or buying a home or maybe uh, retiring um, in, in something very common in Brazil and I guess in many countries in the world where uh, once you start investing, you're, you're, it's actually government mandated for you to build a profile uh, regarding your, your risk aversion or your know, willingness to, to, to uh, take risk. And based on this profile, you, you make some investment recommendations. What's interesting in this project is we address the profiling process in a totally different way, made, made it far more user-friendly and actually provide 
uh, real-time simulations as to, look, you want to buy this, um, but you want to do this uh, for using this sort of investments. This is what's going to happen. You're not going to be able to make it or it's going to take longer than you expect, et cetera. So it provides people during the profiling process uh, feedback and real feedback against non mocked up feedback so they can really do a proper profiling. And once the profile has been put in place and they start making uh, their regular investments, their monthly investments, uh, what's interesting about this tool here is that it adjusts the investment, the ratio as to how much you're going to put in fixed income as opposed to variable income, considering the yields that you have been getting so far, so that the breakdown remains the same as what you established when you created a profile, which is something unheard of. I, I haven't seen any tool from any bank or any uh, broker in Brazil that does something um, as good as, as this. In fact, uh, this project here took us about three weeks to do, and it's, has, it's something so powerful that I've heard about a company in Brazil that actually created a startup uh, just to do that. Um, this is a typical pandemic thing here. Uh, we put in place uh, a cognitive ombudsman and tool to um, capture complaints and uh, just like uh, cyber attacks have arisen like fourfold, complaints have risen fourfold, uh, call centers uh, of companies are all being overwhelmed as we probably know, as everyone here probably knows about. And so companies have been seeking ways to make their uh, ombudsman, their, 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 their organizations that tap into customer complaints and try to, to improve their experience, improve the NPS, et cetera, make them go digital, make them uh, um, scale. And so we created a tool that's basically able to digest uh, complaints in any form, any, any semi-structured complaints, be it from a website, uh, be it in the form of email, be it in, even in the form of articles, as long as it's semi-structured in the sense that you have a, a subject and a body, okay? This tool is able to categorize this information uh, uh, with regards, for instance, to products and within products to subjects uh, within the, the products so that companies can have a, a very systemic organized view as to what's being uh, said about them. And in fact, even, even able to automate uh, uh, actions uh, regarding these complaints. Okay, so we're able to, to, to categorize them in, 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 in categories and topics, we're able to clusterize. Uh, and what's interesting about this project is we, we, we leverage a combination of deterministic approaches and machine learning approaches, which is something that I've been betting on quite a bit. Uh, by combining these two approaches, I'm able to provide time to value in a very short uh, uh, time, and at the same time, provide continuous learning. And um, last but not least, um, so we have done very interesting work with regards to process automation, because uh, none of the, what I showed previously uh, would be as impactful if you're not able to orchestrate this as a single seamless process end-to-end, -end, typically beginning at the CRM and finishing in concluding something like uh, uh, account opening or, or, or delivering something, et cetera, deploying something, et cetera. And so uh, we have created something called the digital worker that orchestrates the entire process end-to-end to make sure everything is done at, at the proper moment and everything that can be automated is automated using RPAs or whatever techniques out there. And what cannot be automated, uh, uh, human uh, intervention is done in, in a very structured form using business process management. And on top of that, this digital worker process uh, leverages a uh, 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 fairly new technology that's been out there called cloud functions in order to uh, have in a very granular form it, uh, functions like uh, document parsing done in a way that's very, very cost efficient. And so as closing remarks, um, it, it's no surprise that uh, COVID has taken the world by storm. Tremendous economic impact in some sectors is going to take five years for recovery. Um, the, the, the organization is going to survive this crisis and the ones that actually will thrive and even be able to withstand uh, uh, um, subsequent crises have to be dynamic, has to be resilient, have to change the way they work. Uh, it's no surprise that digital transformation has become mandatory. Uh, IBM has put in place a uh, very interesting prescription that is, I strongly recommend everyone to look at to deal with this new abnormal environment. Uh, and based on the project that I just showed to you guys, uh, there's empirical evidence that uh, the demand for this kind of innovation will exist out there. Okay. And Last but not least, uh, companies uh, that are thriving, moving from surviving to thriving, which is very important, are the ones who shift from basic cost containment to actually care for investment in order to be able to serve, to, to really serve on this environment, to really uh, thrive in this environment, to really uh, come out of this environment even stronger. So that's pretty much what I had to say here.
And with that, let me uh, relate it back to Ulu. Agustinho, thank you very much about your time and presentation. Uh, a very interesting presentation. You, you are my friend, and I really know about your qualities. <laughs> but I have five questions, maybe three questions for you. I think that you have time maybe to, to end uh, your presentation. Uh, but it's okay for you? Three questions. Oh, great. No, yes. Uh, I'm good until 10.30, so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So the first question uh, I wrote here, uh, you told about the innovation, some innovation key points. And you're talking about the context, the IBM, IBM uh, five business pr uh, priorities and, and this kind of thing. And uh, in your presentation, you told about, about increasing capital investments to build these capabilities and digital transformation is now a priority. So what will be, in your point of view, uh, the impact of the digital transformation process uh, in our companies and especially uh, in the financial sector? Well, um, I think uh, we're at a point of no return. Uh, digital transformation is one of the, those things that once you experiment, uh, there's no turning back. And so uh, it, it's something, therefore, it's something that's going to be ever increasing, it's going to be ever more pervasive in the companies. And what's interesting about digital transformation is that first is happening much faster now, being forced upon us by the uh, uh, crisis. And secondly, uh, companies uh, uh, are only willing to experiment with uh, 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 the uh, make money aspect of innovation of business cases in the sense of improving top line only if it is done through digital transformation. So contrary to popular belief, there is innovation uh, happening uh, beyond just operational efficiency, just be, uh, beyond uh, bottom line. But uh, whenever that happen, when, whenever that's happening is with regards to in, or leveraging digital transformation. So companies are not willing to uh, do anything that involves improving top line if it is not by means of digital transformation. So this is something that you have to be aware, of, be aware of. Okay, if you want to uh, leverage with a client a business case that involves uh, a, a new markets, new opportunities, increasing market share, etc., it has to be uh, through digital transformation. It has to be convened uh, through uh, digital transformation. Wishing uh, very interesting too, but I just want to remember some conversations that, that we had. And I remember maybe on the last week that we told about uh, agile things, fast innovation and this kind of thing. Uh, what do you really understand about agile and fast innovation with uh, correlation uh, with digital transformation? What do you expect about that? Uh, well, basically, uh, I, I, like I mentioned, uh, you, you keep hearing on, on all kinds of reports from IBM, McKinsey, and everywhere on, on, on the web, uh, speed, speed, speed. So, so time to value. Uh, companies are, are not willing anymore to wait uh, a lifetime to see uh, the outcome, the results, the benefits of, of a given project. So you have to change approaches. In, in my personal opinion, at least for the first prototype, I'm not saying for, for entire project, obviously, but at least for the first prototype, you have to review uh, the approaches. You have to be more unencumbered. You have to be uh, 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 you have to be less bureaucratic to 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 be to put it more strictly. And therefore, you have to leverage from agile what makes sense for this kind of thing. But you have to sort of mingle it with other techniques that allow you to move faster. Which is why I have chosen this sort of extreme agile approach that I that I mentioned, where we, we try to pull uh, the best of what we see from agile uh, with other approaches in order to be able to put in front of the client. Uh, innovation as quickly as possible. In fact, uh, 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 folks uh, from Agile normally, uh, they don't like when you talk about speed. They, they, they always make a point that Agile is not really speed. It's, it's something different and they're right about that. And it has its proper place, but the, the moment demands a slightly different approach, at least for this first stage of innovation where you have to put in front of the client something in weeks, not months. But Agushin, do you think that Agile, uh, you talked about speed, innovation, Agile, do you think that it's a, a truly a combination to the financial sector? Do you think that it's possible? Uh, it is, it to, is. To do this I mean, it, it, yeah, the financial sector has been adopting Jive for quite a while. There are quite a few uh, examples uh, in the landscape. In fact, uh, most, if not all, uh, digital transformation products in the financial sector are done with Agile. Uh, the, the only difference is that uh, in the specific uh, environment here that we're living, uh, you might need to go one notch further and, and maybe review, at least from the prototype standpoint, uh, do something even more aggressive than Agile, which is what I pointed out. But, but Agile, yes, is, is quite pervasive in the financial sector uh, and it's been for, 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 for a few years now. 
Mark, and, do that. Uh, sorry. Con uh, just continue uh, with you. Sorry. Uh, and to something you mentioned earlier before I began my presentation, what I thought it was pretty interesting is uh, a, a lot of people ask, uh, what do you mean by digital transformation? Different people have different opinions about that. Uh, my, my geeky opinion on digital transformation is, it's something you probably won't be hearing as often is, you, you, when you do digital transformation, you, you, you make your company software defined. Okay, this mm -hmm. is a very geeky definition of digital mm -hmm. transformation. You become more software defined, okay? Which is truly what happens, okay? Everything starts to evolve <coughs> more and more around software. Software processes trigger things in your company and therefore things become more automated, et cetera, and more scalable. But Agustin, it's a huge uh, question again, because when you told about uh, to be a software uh, company, uh, what kind of skills do you think that we want to have inside uh, our tradition companies here in Brazil? Uh, you're gonna have definitely, need, you're gonna definitely need more <laughs> uh, <laughs> developers for sure. Uh, so it's gonna be clearly a, a, a combination of having more people skilled in hybrid cloud and more people skilled in AI. Okay. In essence, in a nutshell, that's what's going to happen. Okay, and, and the companies are aware of that. Okay, uh, more on, on the air part. The air part is more obvious. Not so obvious the hybrid cloud part. People are now becoming aware that they need this second piece of the equation. They need to be more knowledgeable in hybrid cloud, which basically is the ability to uh, connect their on-premises uh, treasure trove of data, okay, legacy systems with a uh, uh, public cloud presence. But therefore, uh, hybrid cloud is really paramount for that. Wishing uh, uh, two more questions. Um, I remember, I think yesterday we had a conference call, and uh, we were discussing about the quality of our professionals here in Brazil. Do you think that we have, or we are on the same stage than uh, the Chinese market, uh, the, the United States, uh, the USA market, uh, to develop this kind of things here, or we want to do something different to improve uh, our qualities uh, here in Brazil? Do you think that we are we are on the same stage? Uh, I think there, uh, I see bad news and good news in, in this, not only in Brazil, but I think in Latin America. Uh, uh, the bad news is that um, hard sciences don't seem to be um, a, a, as much of a priority in Latin America as it is in other countries, to my dismay. Okay, so it's uh -huh. really unfortunate. Okay, and, and obviously you, you have to follow a, a, a hard science uh, 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 um skill in order to be able to to really participate in this digital world of digital transformation and so forth uh, having said that there's a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of these scarce uh, uh, digital uh, 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 literate uh, resources out there who are not sometimes properly tapped by companies so it's amazing mm -hmm. uh, especially when, it, when we get out of the beaten path of the of the great metropolis great uh, uh, large cities in uh, you find out very skilled pe people in, in very unexpected places. So even though they're, they're, there's clearly not enough uh, skilled people in, in Brazil and Latin America, there's more than people realize. And sometimes they're, not, they're just not uh, in the beaten path. They're not just in traditional places. So if you get out of the uh, main hubs, main centers, main university, the well-known places, places that everyone looks for, uh, you're going to be amazed at the amount of very talented people who are out there. But that uh, given certain uh, um, hindrances in the process of even of, of um, hiring, okay, you're not sometimes able to, to, to reach out to these people, tap into these people. So I strongly urge um, every single company um, to really look out to these people uh, out of the traditional places, out of the traditional universities, like in smaller cities, in, in, in even poor regions of the country where you, you might find uh, une unexpectedly so very, very talented people. And, and I'm surprised over and over and over again, uh, like with, with my dealings with Northeastern Brazil and, and, and with the Western part of Mexico, the amount of talented people who sometimes they're out of the radar of the companies because of, of things like not speaking English, for instance, like people are very talented, but they miss the specific link, a uh, specific piece of knowledge uh, to make them uh, um, suitable for the companies. But something that, it can be addressed in, in a number of ways. Very interesting, my friend. Mark, do you have a, uh, some questions? I have just one to finish it. No, please. Have so. Go ahead. No? Finish, yeah. Okay. Agushin, just a final question. You told us about some examples. Uh, I just wrote here about QR code solutions, blockchain wallet, credit uh, recovery, etc. How many time and what kind of methodology uh, do you use with your team inside IBM? Uh, the, all these examples 
um, except for the one on blockchain wallet, which was developed by Sutter Mankin. All, all the other examples were developed uh, using the extreme agile approach. Uh, only one instance we took a little longer than four weeks was actually the cognitive collection. It took us five weeks because we really wanted to do something super sophisticated. Okay, so it's, it's not even fair to call it a prototype. It's actually on some product. Okay, but in every single instance, we, we leveraged this um, extreme agile approach. In fact, we're so excited about it that uh, I'm seriously uh, uh, talking to my manager in New York about expanding this approach worldwide. I think we are on to something big. I have realized that my colleagues in Middle East and Africa do something somewhat similar. Okay, maybe my colleagues in China do it as well. I, I, I'm in conversations with them. So I, 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 I'm really keen on expanding this approach worldwide within IBM because uh, I, I think it has proven to be very, very effective. I mean, even the agile folks get surprised as to how fast we move. Okay, and move without a technical debt, which is really key, which means creating uh, uh, innovation with quality. Because uh, very often what you see is people created with quality, but it has to be refactored because it has a tremendous technical debt. Okay. Very good, my friend. It's really a pleasure uh, to hear you again. And I just have a final question. Really, Mark, it's a final question. Uh, what kind of suggestion uh, do we have to us, to all of us, to continue to understand about innovation, just to strategies, and right. really to the financial sector, what do you suggest to all of us? Your key points. Uh, this is my question to you, Mark, to me. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, one of the things that I've been, uh, uh, again, I think uh, companies should really, really consider uh, uh, getting out of the beaten uh, track place in order to find uh, technical talent. Otherwise, they're going to be paying uh, premium prices for this talent. They're going to be paying uh, more than they should because they're looking at the right places. Um, secondly, uh, we should find a sort of, I, I hate this term, but it's actually what needs to be done is find shortcuts in order to uh, uh, do rapid skilling of the population. Okay, If you go through trad by traditional means, you won't have enough time, given that our demographic bonus is, is finite. It's not going to go on forever. So uh, uh, in a short while, we're going to run out of young people. So so we have to, to form them in uh, unconventional ways. And I think one of the interesting ways to do that is leveraging initiatives such as P-TECH from IBM, which sort of uh, uh, it kind of inspired, roughly speaking, on the German model of uh, professional schools for technicians, for, for undergraduates. It kind of resembles roughly a community college model of the U.S. as well, in the sense that uh, it's a combination of, of high school and uh, 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 in, in the undergraduate programs or universities in order to, to form at a massive scale fairly fast um, the professions for the new economy, for the new uh, digital economy. So I think countries like Brazil should leverage that intensively. In fact, uh, the technical schools in Brazil are starting to look into that very seriously because that's the only way I see of our country addressing this uh, <clears throat> challenge of forming fast enough uh, digital talent, and at the same time being able to make this talent available to companies so they can really uh, uh, leverage it. Because if the companies aren't able to, 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 to acquire these people, to hire these people, uh, basically uh, they're gonna be uh, delayed in their digital transformation and they're gonna be losing ground to even to competitors from abroad if they're not able to, to bring on board uh, these people. Very good, Agashin, very good. Thank you very much. And our final key point, my final key point, just to remember to all of you that innovation and digital strategy, uh, that we just want to talk about the client. Remember this kind of thing. I think that we want to discuss about data, strategy, culture, but remember about the client. We just want to develop all of the technologies uh, and methodologies that we are discussing here. But we have some, someone in the end of the, uh, this kind of value chain that won um, a, good, uh, a good thing to use and to have a kind of uh, good quality of the of the of the services that we are uh, developing so thank you very much my very much so sorry about my english my friend mark it's your time to to finish uh, our section here and agushin thank you for your time again my friend my yeah. pleasure yeah thank you very much agushin it was a great presentation and discussion i hope uh, i thank you all of you that attended our first webinar session designed specially for the people involved in the ecosystem of digital finance and the technologies and the innovation. Thank you very much, Agustin, for sharing your vast knowledge on the subject and also 
the things that are going on on IBM right now. It's, uh, it's great to hear that. I hope you have all enjoyed. And I just remember you that we're going to have the second step, the second session of our uh, webinar series on September 3rd. And also we're going to have another one in September. And I welcome all of you to take part on it uh, in attending it. And also remember you that this is soon, very soon in November, we're going to have our global digital finance program. And Professor Hugo is part of our faculty on this program. Probably Agostinho is going to be invited again to share his vast knowledge with us. So thank you very much. I thank also our partners in New York, Mary and Michelle, Daniel, my, my colleague at FTC, and also everyone that supported our webinar this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Be safe. Bye-bye. Be safe. Yeah, be safe.